Today is the second of nine messages of this Promised Land series. I'm going to give a quick recap for those of you who might have missed last Sunday's message. For those of you who were here, it'll be a good uh, reminder and just get you back in the groove of, of uh, you know, where, where we've been and where we're going and everything like that. So basically, the story of the Exodus, which involves uh, God raising up Moses, sending him into Egypt because the Israelites were slaves to the Egyptians, and and God setting them free out of slavery and and leading them into a place God was saying, the promised land. There was a real place. It's called modern-day Israel today, and it was going to be their home, and and they were going to have an identity and a a people, and they weren't going to be in slaves. It's, It's an amazing story, but the amazing thing about this story is that all of these encounters and experiences that they had are a picture of your Christian journey. And so even though I've had you turn to Exodus 13, the the whole premise and basis of how we make this series, and I showed you this last week, it's based on 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you look at the screen, in verses 1 through 6, check this out. Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea, the Red Sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and then in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, these things occur, occurred as examples to keep us, everyone say us, from setting on our, our hearts on evil things as they did. And then a few verses later, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 says, these things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. So these stories that we find in the book of Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and Joshua, they are written for us because we find this amazing picture as we look at their journey, we see the picture, we see the will of God and what he's wanting to do for you. You all pray, God, what's your will for my life? Well, we're gonna see it. As we see what God did to his people collectively, you're going to learn so many things about what God wants to do in your life individually. And that's the purpose of this series. So last week, we covered Exodus chapters 1 through 12, where we find Israel in slavery with uh, an evil master. And God shows up to Moses in the burning bush. The bush is burning, and yet it's not really burning. It's not catching fire. Moses kind of trips out a little bit. And God speaks to him, and God raises him up and sends him into Egypt. He shows up there and tells Pharaoh, God is telling you to let his people go. And Pharaoh hardens his heart. He's not down with that at all. And so God begins to pour out these plagues and showers the nation with ten plagues. The last plague being the plague of the death of the firstborn son. And that plague also involved something monumental for the Israelites called Passover. A holiday, a feast, a tradition they still continue to celebrate to this day every Easter season, every spring season. And what they were to do is God said, okay, every family has to sacrifice a lamb. Everyone in that home has to ingest and partake of that lamb. And you're going to have to smear the lamb's blood on the side posts and on the lintel of the house. Cover the front door of the home with the lamb's blood because if you don't, the firstborn child in every home is gonna die. If you don't want judgment to come on your home, then you need to believe there's a substitute that is gonna die in the son's place. This lamb is gonna die in your place. And so every Israelite family did that. And they painted their doors with the lamb's blood. That night at midnight, God passed over every home that had blood on the front door. No Egyptian household did. And every firstborn Egyptian child died that night. 
And that was enough for Pharaoh, for him to say, okay, get out of here. This is too much. You can go free. And it's such an amazing picture of salvation and placing our faith in Christ. In fact, there's not a clearer Old Testament picture of Christ's sacrifice for us than Passover. These people had to trust by faith that the substitutionary blood of a lamb would bring salvation and would allow them to escape from judgment. And that's exactly what we do when we place our faith in Christ and his blood as he dies on the cross as our substitute. Amen? But here's the thing, guys. Here's the thing. The actual event of salvation didn't take place inside the home. The response of deliverance by God happened at the Red Sea. Everyone say Red Sea. That's what we're going to get into today. So I've had you turn to chapter 13. Let's continue in the story. We're going to read verses 17 and 18. It says, It came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, Lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. Skip to chapter 14, beginning in verse 5. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel and the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them. All the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army and overtook them camping beside the sea Besides two names, I don't even want to try to pronounce. Verse 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So, check this out. They were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word we told you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And they sound like, oh, they're kind of whining. But you can relate. You've whined. You've been a baby to the Lord before. You know, those prayers, things aren't working out the way you want. God's not answering your prayers like you thought. And you just get all pessimistic and bitter and It's like, God, why are you hurting my feelings right now? You're not answering me the way I thought you would. And we kind of throw these pity parties. Well, they're doing it too. And the good news is God stuck with them. He still still continued to deliver them as he does with us. Now, I want to show you the map. We're going to be following this map because it is a journey that they're taking. So on the screen, you can see where they've been in Egypt. They're going out. And it says God did not lead them up to Canaan yet because they weren't ready for war. You know, they're, they're, they're brand new believers. And God's like, I'm not going to give them these gnarly challenges quite yet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take them and kind of protect them um, from, from having to, like, go to war. And so he takes them, and you see X marks the spot. And I'm not going to get into all the reasons why this is the, the place where we think um, this is where they cross the Red Sea. But this is where they cross the Red Sea. And I believe. And so they're right here, and they're trapped. They're totally trapped. The Red Sea is on one side. They don't have any boats. And there's a huge mountain pass on the other side. So if they try to run, they don't have anywhere to go. The only way out is to go back where they came from, and Pharaoh's army is closing in on them. And so the people start panicking, and they're convinced they're going to die this day. And so they start giving Moses some mouth because they're like, if we're going to die and you're leading us here, we want you to feel really bad about it before it happens. 
But check out Moses in verses 13 and 14. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you. And you shall hold your peace. You shall hold your peace, meaning you're going to stop giving me lip after this day. Take note of three things Moses said. This will mean something for you. Maybe today or maybe at another time. Take note of this. Number one, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. It's a choice. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Do not let yourself be afraid. Number two, stand still. Quiet your soul. Empty yourself of all the fear and the noise, and you stand still. And number three, you watch because you're going to see the salvation of the Lord. Moses is like, God's going to do something. He's done enough already. He's not going to leave us here stranded. I don't know how. I don't know what he's going to do, but God is going to do something today. And you know the story. God ends up opening a path splits the Red Sea miraculously. The Israelites walk through on dry ground. Pharaoh and his army pursue them. But when Israel gets to the other side, as Pharaoh's in the passageway, God closes up the Red Sea, and Pharaoh and his army all drowned, and they die. It's an amazing picture of salvation. Think about it, because the old life And everything the old life represented was buried and it's gone. It's buried, it's gone, and they're delivered miraculously into a brand new life. It's awesome. But it's not only a picture of eternal salvation, but also of situational and practical salvation. Jesus is not just a one-time savior. All of you know that or else you wouldn't be here. If he was only a one-time savior, you'd be like, okay, I got my ticket. He's not going to do anything else. He's not going to be involved in my life anymore. And you'd be home right now. But you know he's not just a one-time savior. Because life is very hard in a fallen world, and because of the spiritual enemy we have chasing after us, Jesus comes through and saves us all the time. You know this, don't you? When you get to heaven... Jesus is going to show you all the things he really saved you from that you never prayed for, that you had no idea the danger that was going to happen in your life. And he's going to show you all the things he did for you that you didn't even know of, and you're just going to praise him. And you're just going to be so thankful, even more thankful, because he is the Savior. He's the Savior. And this has happened so many times in my life. I mean, there's so many, so many stories of God, maybe big Big things he did to save me, little things he did to save me. You know, recently, some of you know this story. Remember around Christmas time when we were looking for a house and it was just crazy. I mean, things were getting cray cray in my house because the Lord had led us to sell our home, take advantage of a little bit of equity. Okay, we're going to do that. Let's rent for a little while. And we could just find nothing. Nothing. We had about 15 to 20 homes fall through, some of them literally in the last minute, the last minute. And the very last one that fell through, we missed it by a half an hour. And we had our stuff loaded up to go see our family in Utah for Christmas. And I'm thinking, we're going to have to stay home. I thought this was going to be it. And as I'm walking out the door of the property management office thinking, what am I going to tell McKinsey we're not leaving today? I hear a, oh, wait, 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 wait. Um, We just got a house today. It's not even on the market. No one knows about it. Do you want to go look at it? Um, Sure. And um, it was awesome. It just dropped in our lap. Total God thing. After so many closed doors, God used the closed doors to finally open the bigger door. So all my whining really didn't do anything for me because God wanted to hook us up in the end. And it's our dream house for right now. I mean, it really is. We love it so much more than our old house. It's perfect for our boys. They love it. It's really cool. And 
during times in, in that season, I was so deflated and discouraged, and um, the Lord comes through. He comes through. So, guys, the next time you feel cornered and you feel like you got nowhere to go, you got no resources to help you, and you got the enemy or some kind of trouble or some kind of deadline closing in fast on you, don't forget this lesson today. Do not forget this lesson. Don't forget that Israel was in this situation because God had led them into it. They weren't doing nothing wrong. God was not chastening them. He wasn't displeased with them. They hadn't been disobeying him. God, on purpose, led them into this place where they were trapped and they could not save themselves. And by sight and by intellect, it seemed like disaster was the worst possible end result, and that's where their minds went. They immediately got all pessimistic, no faith in their heart. We're going to die today. They just give up and they crumble. Where are you at when these situations happen to you? Do you so easily crumble, or do you take heart? What kind of person are you? Are you a half-glass empty kind of a Christian or a half-glass full kind of a Christian? Where is your faith in Christ stand today? The trial you're in will reveal it, or the trial, if you're not in one, don't worry. It'll happen sometime this week. (laughs) There's your Sunday morning encouragement. The next trial will reveal your faith in Christ. They crumbled. Thankfully, Moses did not. Moses walked by faith and not by sight. He walked by faith and not by reason, human reason. And his confidence in God led him to say three things. I am not going to be afraid because fear is the devil's playground in your mind. I feel like I want to be scared, but I'm not going to let it happen. I will battle this fear, and I will not give in to it. Fear is the opposite of faith. I'm going to stand still. They're like, what are you going to do? I'm not going to do nothing. Haven't you learned if you try to take up your own cause, if you keep trying to do that, the scary thing is God will let you? I'm just going to stand still with my quiet, confident faith. Because Moses knew he couldn't do anything about it, and he knew God wasn't expecting him to save himself. In great maturity, he stayed calm, no bickering, no fighting, no getting short, no short fuse. He rested instead of becoming a nervous wreck. And he said, I'm also keeping my eyes wide open because God's going to do something awesome, and I want to watch it. I want to be here when it goes down. You see, Moses knew something, and God wants you to know it. He wants you to know it too. He knew that without faith, it is impossible to please God. The next time you have a trial, if you only have wishful thinking that God is going to do something, then wishful thinking is what you're going to be left with. Wishful thinking has no substance to God. But Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that faith is the evidence of things unseen. God looks at faith and said, that carries weight with me. And faith pleases him. Faith pleases him. Every time God is moved on behalf of a believer with his power, there's been a human heart saying, I don't know what you're going to do, but I believe you're there and you're going to do something. Moses did not eke his way through this whole experience. He walked boldly with faith all the way through. How do we know this? Check out the screen, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 27 through 29. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. It's by faith, by faith, by faith. He really believed, and God came through. There's something incredible, this statement near the beginning of this passage. It said, he endured as seeing him 
who is invisible. This is for somebody here today. Some of you in here, you need this. Moses got through because he saw him, although he's invisible. Some of you need this today. Your endurance will come as you learn to see God, although he's invisible with the human eye. You see him with the spiritual eye. If you need to endure, you need to see God by faith. Because God will always respond to this kind of faith. He always will. And remember, God will put you in these kinds of situations just like he did with Israel. And when he does, remember these three things. You should have written them down by now. Don't be afraid. It's a command. It's an imperative. It's not an option. Don't be afraid. Be still. And keep your eyes open. And watch what God's going to do for you. He might come through at the 11th hour. It seems like he's going to be late, but God always comes through, doesn't he? God always comes through. Can you say amen to that? Where does your faith in God stand today? You need to look at yourself. You need to look inward. Where does your faith stand when trials come your way? Stand in Christ and don't crumble to fear. There's something else that I thought was really powerful in this story. We're going to just continue reading uh, verses 15 through 20 now. It says, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians And they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud, everyone say pillar of cloud, It went from before them, it moved, and now it stood behind them. It stood behind them. Verse 20, so it came in between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus, it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. So the pillar of cloud comes. To the Egyptians, it was a cloud that produced darkness, but on the other side of the exact same cloud, it produced light and was a protective barrier between Israel and the army coming to kill him. Think about it. The same presence, the same manifestation of God meant darkness and opposition and judgment to those not of faith, but it meant light and life and hope and deliverance to those of faith. And the Bible and Jesus still does the same thing. It divides. You read the Bible, when the gospel goes out, there are those who get saved and there are always haters in the crowd. And it divides. Jesus said, I've come to divide because this message will bring some people in and to those who harden their heart, it will be a message of opposition. The same presence, the same gospel. Wow. Now, what I want your hearts to understand is this. Listen to this. The presence of God came before the deliverance of God came. You recognize that in your own life? The presence of God came before the deliverance came. If you're a Christian, you know this about God, that when you really, really, really need him to come through for you, he really, really, really is trying to go closer in his relationship with you. And somewhere in that, he does deliver, and he comes through, especially when your heart draws closer to him in prayer and worship. I know this is true of God because I've experienced it. Sometimes I'm just kind of 
stagnant, plateauing. I'm not like backslidden, but I'm, I'm just not very passionate. I'm not praying with uh, fervency, really. It's just my spiritual life is kind of dry. And, uh, you know, God will try to speak to me here and there softly. And he's like, okay, you don't get it. Trial. <laughs> and it whips me back into prayer shape. You know what I mean? You, trial. Okay, Jesus, I'm coming back. And he just does the little thing to get my heart back in relationship with him. Every trial you have, God sees as an opportunity to grow closer in his relationship with you. That's where he's coming from. In this story we're reading, God's presence is first realized in an amazing way, and then he parts the Red Sea. And isn't he so good at providing paths that nobody else could provide? You're up till one in the morning thinking, is it going to be behind curtain number one, two, or three? Because you've you've thought about it thoroughly and you've thought about all the scenarios of how it could work out or not and you're praying and you know it's going to be that way and all of a sudden God does something you never could have foreseen and you realize, okay, your ways are much higher. I would have never done it this way, but your way is the better way. He provides paths that no one else could provide. Think about your life. Think about what God parted and moved out of the way just to get you to where you're saved and you know you're going to heaven today. Think of the ocean of sin and separation he parted. Think of the mental obstacles he worked on you and parted. Think of the bitterness and the beef you thought you had with God and he parted it and he provided a path so that you could have heaven and eternal life. Amen? There are red seas in all of our lives. It's when you come to an impasse and you're stuck and there's no way you can go back, but you can't get out of it in the present either. And You need God to do something. And it's by your faith in God, by you continuing to acknowledge and recognize his presence, his presence in your life, you end up passing through, and God delivers, and there's great things awaiting on the other side. Listen to what God says here, Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 and 2. But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you, O Israel, the one who formed you, says, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When Not if, but when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. Guys, faith puts you in positions to receive miracles from God. If you look at Jesus and you look at the miracles he performed, what was the common Uh, thread through all of those, he asked the person, do you believe? The person says, can you heal me? Do you believe? And he always put it, I have the power. I got the stuff. I got some good stuff. But do you believe I got the good stuff? And he asked them, do you believe? And when they say yes, kablamo. There it is, the power, the healing. Kablamo. faith puts you in position to receive miracles sometimes they're big sometimes they're small but it's your faith in Christ which will allow your life to become a sequence of divine interventions from God Things happen in your life that you couldn't do. Other people couldn't do it either. You're just constantly in awe saying only God could do this. That's a radical life. That's a fun life. That's not a boring life. Christianity is not boring when life is like this. When you put your faith out there and you put yourself out on the limb 
and you trust in God to do things you know you couldn't do and other people couldn't do, and all of a sudden, sequence by sequence, season to season, day by day, rad stuff happens in your life because you believe and you see him who is invisible. And you see him and you filter him through all your experiences. And so, guys, I, I want to encourage you to press yourself beyond your limits. We all have a bubble. You know, and, and if you've been walking with the Lord from the while, you get this comfortable little bubble in your Christianity where it's comfortable. You just kind of put cruise control and you're just kind of coasting in life and Jesus is like, uh-uh, a cross ain't comfortable. And he's always wanting to burst that bubble to get you outside of yourself, to get you to further yourself. Jesus is here saying, I can get you where you can't get yourself. I can help you outdo yourself. No matter how hard you work, I will help you outdo what you could do alone. That's what he does. So my encouragement to you is, please think about this. Please receive this. Go beyond the place. Go beyond the place where your unbelief has never allowed you to go in your life. Unbelief will get you to hit a wall. Can you ask God today for the grace and the faith that God can do it? Maybe it's something personal in your life, something about yourself, an achievement maybe you've been trying to do. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your home and you've hit a wall and can you by faith, before you see it, can you by faith say, I'm going to go beyond where my emotions have, will not let me go. My fear will, will not let me cross this border. Can you go beyond those limits? Because if you do, your life will change and transform and miracles and divine things will happen to you, it will, it really will. If you believe it, say, got it. Good. So the rest of the story, you know, you get the vision of Charlton Heston, rod in one hand, raises his arm of the other, it just splits, man. How gnarly. They walk through. As they're standing on the other side, they look back. Pharaoh's coming. Moses stretches his staff over it, and it just collapses in on them. It even says the bodies start to wash up on shore, and they're just standing on the other side, looking back, just saying, we're never going back here. It's done. God did it. And so remember, the Passover and the Red Sea together points to your salvation in Christ. It's a picture of what God did with you on that day or in that season of your life. They believed the message that if they applied the blood of the Passover lamb, God would spare them from judgment and then God responded to their faith by delivering them from their life of bondage by burying Egypt at the bottom of the sea. Also, remember in our foundational verse in 1 Corinthians 10, the Apostle Paul likens this experience to baptism. So read the screen. I'll show it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now, the word baptized means to be joined and identified with someone. Three things it says they were baptized into. They were baptized into the person, they were baptized into the sea, and they were baptized into the pillar of cloud. They were baptized into their deliverer. They were baptized into the water, meaning their old life was buried as they crossed through, and they were baptized into the pillar, the presence of God in their midst. 
And so being baptized into Moses, they're identified with him because he's now standing on the other side. Their old identity, their old master, their old life is away from them. They're separated from it now because it's buried. It's buried at the bottom of the ocean. Their new identity is found in their God-given deliverer. Israel was baptized into Moses. We are not. We are baptized into Jesus Christ. And our old life is not buried in the bottom of the ocean. It was buried in the bottom of a tomb in Jerusalem. Amen? And our identity standing on the other side happened the moment Jesus opened his eyes and woke from death. We're identified with that resurrection. Check out Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. It says, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. When you placed your faith in Jesus, do you realize what was really happening? When you did that, he baptized your sins into his body. He then killed the sin off when he died on the cross and gave you a new life when he rose. And when you get water baptized, that's what you're symbolically and publicly declaring. This happened. I go down, the old is gone, I come up, there's a new man or woman filled with Jesus. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him you were raised to a new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. So now Israel, as they look back and they see their former bondage gone, they turn around, they're standing on the other side of the bank with a whole brand new life ahead of them. Think of the, how crazy, how awesome. Like, we're free. What's life going to be like now? And you know, for you, just remember You've been delivered from the bank of eternal death. God miraculously provided a path called the cross, and right now you stand on the shores of eternal life. Amen? The next thing that happens in their journey, we're going to see the fruit. We're going to see the evidence of people who really have been delivered by God. Chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, and I will exalt him. And, and it goes on, this, this praise. They start singing to God. So here's the point. Delivered people become worshiping people. You can't help it. It's not something that you have to do. It's something you can't help but not to do. And I remember my own journey of when it came to worship. God did a rad work of delivering me from alcohol and heavy drugs and just a, a really selfish, cold heart, and, you know, I started going to church, and I remember looking at the words on the screen, and they meant something to me, and I would just kind of stand, but it was like, there's no way I'm singing. Just, I'm too prideful to sing. I don't want him hearing me. I don't, have, I don't have a good singing. I'm not doing it, and so I would sing in my heart, and the Lord knew, but as I got closer to the Lord, it was like, Come on, it's got to come out. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's like an apple tree really ain't no good unless it's producing some apples. So it's like get the fruit out there. And I remember it was a whisper at first. It was like, and it was old, that old school worship like, open the eyes of my heart. You know, just like sob barely. And then I, oh, as the weeks go by, I got a little louder, a little more comfortable. And then I remember one time my favorite worship song in that season came on and it was just 
awesome and the message was awesome and God was pounding into my heart and it was great. And he was like, I saw other people lifting up their hands and I wanted to do it so bad, but here I am, the hands in the pockets, dude, and I'm fighting God. I'm not going to do it, God. Remember when I first started to do this thing with you and come to church? I told you, I'm not going to become a churchy person. And raising the hands, that's too churchy. And I'm not churchy, God. Remember, you said I could just come the way I am. And I'm wrestling. And I remember the moment when I just finally, I'm like, brah. And it felt like shackles came off of me. I was so free. I was so liberated. The moment I did it, it was like an electrical surge from God. It was like, and just power and grace and his presence just came in. And it was awesome. And I'm just like, I don't care what people think of me. If I'm going to be a fool, I'll be a fool for Jesus, you know. And I'm thinking about that, and everyone around me is like, they're not paying attention to me at all. <laughs> they could care less what's going on with me. But I was so self-conscious. That's what I thought, you know. And it was so freeing. And I had a journey of worshiping. But when you're really delivered and you know it, you worship. You worship. Much different when you sing a song compared to singing a song to the Lord. It's a powerful thing. There's one last thing we're going to see here in chapter 15 for today. Skip down to verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness And found no water. No water for three days? Well, it's going to be on the third day that stuff happens. Because Jesus rose again on the third day. You'll see these three days all over the Old Testament. He's going to deliver on the third day. Verse 23, when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. Marah means bitter. And the people complained against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet and drinkable. So here's the thing. They come after three days of no water in the desert. That's not comfortable. That's not fun. And they see this water. It looks good on the outside. They think it's going to be good. But when they really get to the substance of it, it's no good. It's a picture of who they used to be. It's a picture of who you used to be acting like everything's all smooth and cool on the outside. But there's a bitter mess in the substance of what's really going on in the heart. What happens? God says, hey, Moses, see this tree? Take one of these branches, throw the branch into the tree. Aye, aye. Weird, but okay. As soon as he throws the branch into the water, a miracle happens and the water changes, and it becomes drinkable. What in the world are we supposed to get out of this? Let me show you a verse. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5. God says, the time is coming, says the Lord, when I will place a righteous branch on King David's throne. The branch, obviously the focal point. Jesus is likened to a branch in the Old Testament. So the lesson about the bitter springs at Mara are simple. Jesus takes lives that are bitter and unclean and makes them into something pure and sweet when he's allowed to come in. Isn't that awesome? That's what he did to Israel. That's what he's done in our lives and what he continues to do as well. God takes bitter, unclean hearts. And when Christ comes in, he makes us clean, he makes life sweet, and he makes us useful for God. So why would we ever, ever try to drink from other wells, wells of bitterness, wells of empty promise, when we can drink the free living water, eternal water of Jesus Christ? Amen? So just a quick recap so far of the journey. They're enslaved to a wicked master. That's you and me before salvation. Satan dominated us. The devil ruled us. And we were his captive. But God sent a rescue, a deliverer. And when they applied the blood 
of their substitute and they believed the blood of that substitute, they were delivered from judgment and they passed through the Red Sea. They were baptized into their deliverer as you and I are baptized into Jesus. Their past was destroyed. And now as they stand on the other side of the Red Sea, God instantly starts to take the bitterness and the brokenness and he starts to make life sweet. Everyone say sweet. Sweet. Yes. (laughs) Now for me, this passage of scripture has been really heavy for me, to be honest with you, based on what's going on in our lives. I don't know if this happens to you, but it's crazy when stuff is going on in my life and we're just happening to follow along in the Bible text or wherever we're at. And all of a sudden that week, it just is meant right for me. Has that ever happened to you? It's just like, oh my gosh, this is exactly my life right now. God just, God God hooks it up. He knows what he's doing. It's awesome how he does that. And all this week, this has just been like, okay, this is heavy. And so when I've been teaching and preaching today, honestly, I've been preaching to myself. I've been like encouraging myself. I've been challenging myself. And I'll tell you why. Uh, Most of you, you've heard the story three years ago, uh, my youngest son, Gage, was born with a major heart defect that uh, they missed during pregnancy. They didn't know it happened, so he he was born at the wrong hospital, and he almost died uh, several times throughout the process. He was very, very close. And uh, he ended up getting three surgeries, major open heart surgery, and uh, God did an amazing work. We had to live in Hollywood for about a month during that process. And uh, you guys were here just blessing us, praying for us, visiting us. It was awesome support we received. And, uh, you know, the doctor, the surgeon said, you know, it's, it's good right now. Don't limit him. Like, let him go. And just raise him like your other boy. And Gage is, he's, he's, he's crazy. I mean, he's fearless, fearless little kid. And every six months, we've had to go see his cardiologist. And it'll probably be that way for the rest of his life because the surgeon said, although you can just let him go do whatever he wants, he's going to have to have two open heart surgeries sometime in his life. Um, Probably a lot later on, you know, they even said like probably, you know, maybe 15, 20, the later, the better, he'll be fine uh, for a while. So when we go do these six month checkups, it's through an ultrasound and every time we've gone, it's like, yep, looks great. Uh, It's very short, we'll see in six months. So last week we were expecting that result again, and uh, for some reason the cardiologist said, you know, you know, I'm, I'm saying just a couple things here, and you can't really see too clear uh, with an ultrasound. So he said, we need to, we need to send him to Hollywood, and, and we need to get a camera in there to really kind of see. I just, I want, I want to make sure everything's good in there. So this Tuesday, this Tuesday at 6 a.m., we're going to be in Hollywood, and they're going to put Gage out, and they're going to go through his leg, and they're going to take a camera up into his heart so that they can just get an accurate picture uh, for what's going on. So it's not the news that we wanted to hear at all uh, because, you know, first, a three-year-old going through that isn't going to understand why am I hurting mommy, daddy, get me out of this place. And the older he gets, the bigger and stronger the heart gets too, you know, and the more he can process everything. So there's, there's you know, a positive and a negative side to this. The positive is, yes, I want them to see what's going on. I want to know full, full, full well what, what is happening up in there. Um, obviously, the negative is, and not that this is going to happen, but this is the first step to major open heart surgery uh, to go and, and get up in there. So we would appreciate your prayers this week. If you can remember, Tuesday, 6 a.m. And, uh, you know, what can we do? What, what can we do? How can I be afraid if I stand up here and say, Moses wasn't afraid? Don't be afraid. Don't crumble. And so I'm applying this to my life. I'm, I'm taking these principles very, to heart as I stand on the bank of this Red Sea of my life. And I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm not going there. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not doing this. My God's too big. And I'm going to be still. I'm going to be quiet before the Lord. I'm not going to let things flare up in my own home. Because, you know, when things get a little stressful, how it can, you know, affect your marriage and everything. It's like, I'm not going there. I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to keep my eyes open. Because God's going to do something cool through this.
You know, God is always up to something, and he's at work. And, um, you know, we're just, we're praying that he never has to have surgery again, that they'll find nothing wrong, that it'll be a miracle. If God chooses, for some reason, to heal him through surgeries, we're praying it doesn't happen now, you know, that it would be later on in his life. So uh, we would appreciate that prayer.